Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going all the way back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today we're going to go on a journey that stretches from the clatter of card punches in the 1960s to the real-time microcontroller brains that make your drone fly straight today. We're going to talk about multitasking, how it started, how it evolved, and most importantly, how it actually works under the hood. If you ever wondered how your system juggles a dozen apps, multiple CPU cores, and maybe even a real-time thread to keep your rocket from tumbling sideways, well, buckle up, because this is where we find out. But to understand multitasking, we have to go back. Way back. Now, in the early days of computing, you didn't sit down at a keyboard. You approached the machine, carefully, quietly. You brought your tray of 80-column Fortran punch cards or magnetic tape and handed them over like a supplicant bringing an offering to the temple. You didn't run a program. You submitted a job. And the operators, clad in lab coats and probably with pocket protectors that could survive re-entry, would feed your job into the queue of the mighty mainframe. This was batch processing. The computer would execute one job at a time, in sequence, reading each card or tape, running the program, and printing the results, and moving on. There was no interaction, no feedback, and certainly no debugging. If your Fortran job had a syntax error on card 74, you found out about an hour later when you were handed back a printout that just said syntax error and your whole day was essentially wasted. Now, the system was efficient in that it kept the machine busy as a whole, but it was soul-crushing for the human users. Worse, it was wasteful in the one place that really mattered, CPU time. If a job needed to do something slow, like wait for a tape seek or a line printer to finish chugging out the output, the CPU would just sit there idle. And this was a scandal, because back then the CPU cost more than a small house and could only be justified if it stayed busy every second. And so arose the next great innovation, time sharing. Time sharing was simple in concept and revolutionary in effect. Instead of dedicating the whole machine to one job at a time, you let multiple users log in concurrently, usually over serial terminals connected by teletype or even acoustic coupled modems, and the operating system would give each session a tiny slice of CPU time. So it would run a bit of user A's job, and then a bit of user B's job, and then user C's job, and so on. And if done quickly enough in rotation, say 60 times a second, users would never notice that they were sharing at all. It felt like you had your own machine. Early time-sharing systems like CTSS at MIT and later the Multics project at Bell Labs laid the groundwork, but it was Unix that took the ideas mainstream. Unix brought with it the concepts of processes, signals, standard input-output redirection, and crucially, the scheduler, the bit of code that decided which process got to run next and for how long. The primary application for viewing the scheduler on Unix was called TOP, and it served as my inspiration for the details view of the Windows Task Manager. This was the birth of the preemptive scheduler, and it came with our first taste of true multitasking. It's worth pausing here to talk about how that actually works, because if you're a programmer, especially when used to async, await, or multithreading, the magic under the hood should be fascinating. Preemptive multitasking relies on a hardware timer interrupt, usually fired by the programmable interval timer, or its modern equivalent, every few milliseconds. On my old PDP-11 running BSD Unix, the interval is once per power line cycle, so 60 hertz. And when that interrupt hits, if the CPU suspends whatever it's doing, saving all of the relevant registers, program counter, and flags, and then invokes the scheduler. The scheduler then decides, based on priority, fairness, I.O., waiting state, and other heuristics, which process or thread should run next. It restores that thread's context entirely onto the CPU and resumes execution as if that thread had always been in charge. And the trick is that none of the programmers are aware that they were just shoved off the CPU or put back onto it. This basic technique, context switching via timer interrupts, still powers virtually every modern operating system and is what lets us write applications that seem to run in parallel even on single core machines. Now fast forward to the 1980s and the dawn of personal computing. While minis and mainframes were running things like Unix and serving multiple users, desktop PCs were lucky to run one program at a time. The Apple II, the Commodore 64, and the early IBM PCs had no multitasking at all. You ran a program and that program owned the machine. But then came a machine that changed everything, the Commodore Amiga. Released in 1985, the Amiga was a marvel. It had custom chips for audio, video, and DMA, and crucially, it ran Amiga DOS, a multitasking operating system based on a preemptive kernel called Exec. It supported tasks, semaphores, message passing, and prioritized scheduling. You could drag Windows copy files and listen to mod music all simultaneously and just in 512k of RAM. As a former operating system developer myself, I still doff my cap to the elegance of Exec, which was developed primarily by a fellow named Carl Sanserath. It was a microkernel before microkernels were even cool, with a modular message-based architecture that would influence systems for decades to come. But while the Amiga gave us a glimpse of the future, most PC users got stuck with something else. 
that something was cooperative multitasking and it came bundled with Windows 3.0 and Windows 3.1. Under cooperative multitasking, each application was responsible for giving up the CPU voluntarily when it wanted to. If it didn't, if it looped too long or hung on a modal dialogue or something, the whole system froze. It was like being in a conversation where everybody agreed to take turns speaking, except sometimes somebody would forget to stop talking. The system couldn't take the CPU away, it had to be given back, like the conch shell in Lord of the Flies. I've got the conch! 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 conch. Ow! And if a program didn't do that, well, welcome to the infamous frozen desktops of the early 90s. And then came Windows 95. Now, Windows 95 was a mixed bag, but it did introduce preemptive multitasking, kind of. If you were running 32-bit Windows applications, they were scheduled preemptively using a kernel scheduler not unlike what you'd find in Windows NT. But, and this is a huge but, 16-bit Windows apps still ran using the old cooperative model. And worse, out of necessity, they still shared a single address space and a single shared heap. That meant one rogue 16-bit app could overwrite memory and crash all of the others. The OS, for compatibility reasons, had to have one foot in the future and one foot stuck back in the past. This hybrid model created one of the most subtle bugs I ever debugged. A Win16 app would occasionally stop the global atom table and cause random failures in unrelated apps. It took a long time to track down and occurred only under low memory conditions and sometimes only with GDI heavy apps. This was the price we all paid for backward compatibility, but I think the team did an admirable job of managing the trade-offs between ultimate compatibility and useful robustness. But over in the professional corner of the Microsoft world, a different operating system was brewing, one that didn't compromise. And that system was Windows NT. NT was a ground-up, 32-bit, preemptively multitasked, protected memory OS. It borrowed heavily from VMS thanks to Dave Cutler and his team and introduced a layered, modular kernel that still forms the basis of Windows today. NT didn't just preemptively multitask. It introduced thread-level scheduling, asynchronous I.O., memory map files, weightable timers, and a fully-fledged kernel object model. And unlike its consumer cousin, NT could handle multiple processors, not just simulate multitasking, but for real, in parallel across multiple cores. Now this raises a whole new set of problems. If you've got two or more cores executing threads simultaneously, then you've just entered the jungle of concurrency. Race conditions, priority inversion, deadlocks, false sharing on cache lines. If you've ever wondered why multi-threaded programming is hard, it's because you're not just sharing time anymore, you're sharing space. Two threads might hit the same memory at the same instant, and unless you've locked it properly or used atomic instructions, all bets are off. And that's why modern kernels, whether NT, Linux, or macOS, use fine-grained locks, processor affinity, interrupt steering, and NUMA-aware scheduling just to keep things running smoothly. It's a high-stakes dance, and the choreography is constantly evolving. And speaking of evolving, let's shift gears to real-time systems. Now, real-time doesn't mean fast. It means predictable. In a real-time OS like FreeRTOS, the key requirement is that certain tasks must be executed within a fixed time window. You can't just say, read the sensor pretty off, and you, if you need it to happen every two milliseconds guaranteed or your quadcopter will flip upside down, that's when you need real-time. FreeRTOS achieves this by using fixed priority scheduling with optional preemption and static task allocation. You usually disable memory allocation entirely during runtime. It's bare metal programming at its most elegant. No page faults, no demand paging, no overcommit. Just tasks, interrupt service routines, and the raw silicon. If you've ever written firmware for an STM32 or an ESP32, you know the feeling. Every tick counts and latency is the enemy. And yet, real-time systems aren't just for drones and toasters. They're in medical devices, automotive ECUs, avionics, and even industrial robots. If it must respond on time every time, it probably runs a real-time OS. After all, when your engine is spinning at 5,000 RPM and it's now time to fire the spark plug, soon doesn't work. And that's how we got from batch jobs and punch cards to multitasking kernels that schedule across 64 cores on machines running at 5 gigahertz while also guaranteeing that your pacemaker ticks on time. Multitasking has evolved from a way to keep expensive CPUs busy into a world where we can keep hundreds of software illusions alive simultaneously. Each browser tab, each background service, and every GUI app is a lie told so convincingly that you forget they're all sharing the same chip, or at least several slabs of it. So the next time your computer hangs, remember, somebody somewhere didn't yield the CPU or maybe forgot a lock. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you'd consider leaving one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Do me a favor and double check to ensure that you really still are, as I've had a few people reach out to ask me about having been magically unsubscribed at some point. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.